if you want. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the first in a four part series. We're really excited to have you here. My name is Vanessa Smith Torres. I am a member of A Miami's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, as well as the president of the National Organization of Minority Architects South Florida chapter. Uh, thank you much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really excited to talk today about JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and to kick off this series talking specifically about justice. Um, so without further ado, I just want to highlight some of the upcoming events uh, that we have with AIA Miami. Um, so we do have the, um, with, uh, with MCAD, there will be a City of Columns, a film screening that will be taking place on August 18th um, at 7 p.m. So that'll be a film screening and a panel discussion um, about one of the neighborhoods in Osaka. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be this time of year if we did not mention the design awards in um, October. So save the date, uh, October 29th, and we hope to see you there in person in Pinecrest Gardens. So I'm really excited about this event and hope to see everyone there. Um, so I also wanna say thank you to SoFlo Noma uh, for having this JEDI conversation be a part of our monthly meeting, uh, of our general meeting and incorporating it into our programming. So again, my name is Vanessa. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be uh, addressing specific questions at the end. Um, so please put those in the chat um, and feel free to, to express your, your thoughts and, and ask anything along the way. So again, this is the first of a four part series. Today, uh, we are talking specifically about justice and how, what this, what this JEDI framework uh, kicks off with, um, and each each Tuesday of this month, we will be attacking each one of these different concepts. So, first, what is Jedi? It's it's really important that we start these conversations with uh, a common vocabulary, a common language. Um, so, when we're talking about justice, it can be it can start to become overwhelming to think about all of the injustices that there are in this world and in our society. Um, but as we talk about Jedi and architecture, justice and architecture specifically, we're talking about removing the barriers, removing these, these barriers to entry to, to our profession, to the built environment. So justice specifically, uh, we're focusing on these, these barriers to entry. Equity, we're, we're looking at allocating resources in proportion to the needs, right? So it's not equality where everyone gets the same, but it's equity where everyone gets what they need um, in order to get these, these outcomes, to get equality as an outcome. Diversity being this, this array, this, this multitude of, of experiences and perspectives um, and inclusion being the, the, the final output being that creating that sense of belonging, that, that ability to fully participate in, in this case, being the architectural profession. So again, this is an AIA Miami uh, and event, and we are specifically talking about architecture, but a lot of these ideas uh, can translate to other fields and other professions or they're really global ideas. So I, I encourage you, uh, if, if you're not specifically an architect or an architectural profession to, to take a look at that, to, to think about how you can incorporate Jedi into your own practices. So when we talk about justice and equity, these are the building blocks. So justice and equity will give us diversity and inclusion. So without 
doing the framework in the beginning, we cannot get to a truly comprehensive diversity and inclusion at the end. Um, so that's something to, to bear in mind. So again, today we're talking specifically about justice and this idea of dismantling barriers. What are the barriers to entry? Uh, what can we do to break those down and allow more people into our profession and into, uh, our, into architecture, architectural, architectural space, architectural education, et cetera? So a lot of people push back on this wondering where did Jedi come from? Why Jedi? You know, we've been talking about diversity for years uh, and this is not a new concept. We know, we know that diversity is a goal that we want to reach. So why add all of these new words, all of these new acronyms to the conversation? The simple answer is we know more now. You know, the more we have these conversations, the more that that we talk about what needs to be done, then we develop new language to talk about it. So we talked about diversity a lot in like the 90s. Um, and the business case for diversity was there and all of, you know, everyone talked about diversity being, being the goal. But what happens when you just take diversity and, and that's the only thing you're striving for? In the real world, you can have people of all different backgrounds in the same space, but the outcomes are different because of the environment, because of the, the society that they're in. Whereas if you incorporate justice and equity into your goals, then you're able to, one, your justice, we have taken down that barrier. We have taken down that wall, allowing everybody um, equal access to the game. And here in equity, we're providing in accordance to their needs, those resources in order for them to get that equal access. So justice and equity gives you diversity and inclusion. So the business case for diversity. And um, we'll, we'll talk about this one a little later as to why diversity is important, um, but it's not enough. You can't just add diversity and stir. Um, you need to be able to empower people to have their voices heard, um, You know, not just have a token person in the room representing, representing a community, but actually include the, their voices in the conversation. And so that's what we're talking about, is how do we get to that point where everybody's voices are included? So this is important in our practice because we work with communities, we work for communities. And if we do not represent the communities we work with, how do we understand their needs? How do we develop trust? How do we have conversations uh, with communities that we're not a part of if we cannot, if we cannot empathize with them? Um, so being able to, to have that inclusive conversation in order, in order to be able to have Di diversities of opinion and feedback, we need to do the, the building blocks. We need to work on justice. We need to work on equity. Um, the, the results otherwise, this is uh, an example of Robert Moses's work in, um, in New Orleans specifically, the Claiborne Avenue overpass where it went right through uh, a really vibrant, community of color through their, their main thoroughfare with these large live oak trees um, that were a community gathering space. Um, so this, this construction really cut through the heart of the Treme and really divided and bisected the community. Um, and this, this, this streetscape now is not a vibrant neighborhood. It's, it's kind of, uh, um, under underfunded, under underutilized, um, and there have been community community reclamations of the space, but that's that's a whole other hour long conversation. Uh, but 
the point is that they cut down all these trees. They built this overpass through this minority neighborhood. They did not do that through the other neighborhood where, where a sister overpass was proposed. Um, and there is a reason for that. The people in power did not represent the community here in Treme. The decision makers did not represent the community here in the Treme. The, the vocal groups, the community groups did not represent the people here in the Treme. And so if we do not have these voices being heard, if we do not listen to the communities, if we do not have practices in place, we risk our profession doing more harm than good. And so when we think about our profession, who is, who are those decision makers? There's, you have all seen this before, I am sure, all of these numbers, all of these statistics. Um, while NCARB releases, uh, NCARB by the numbers year after year, uh, and we see growth, we see growth in the student population. What you, what you also see is that the growth in diversity is not happening as quickly in positions of leadership. So as, as the career goes on, diversity drops off. And why is that? Those barriers to entry, those career pinch points, uh, those moments between you know, in, when you're in high school, applying to colleges, applying to degree programs, when you're in architecture school, that transition from architecture school to emergent professional, that transition from emergent professional to licensure candidate, and on and on and on and so forth until, until principal. So these, these career transitions, these pinch points, we're always seeing a drop off in diversity. And when I say diversity, I'm, I'm not just talking about racial or ethnic, but also gender, um, also uh, sexual orientation. Uh, so all of anything you can think of that is a different experience, a different perspective, a different identity. We have, we have a problem in this profession and in many others, um, but in this profession, we have, we have a problem. And how can we dismantle those barriers? How can we provide pathways to entry for people of underrepresented populations? So you might think, well, you just have to work hard. You just have to work hard and and tough it up, and you know, put on put on your your big boy pants and and you know, make your make your position heard. That's that may have worked for you. Um, that may have worked for someone else. But you have to recognize that we do not all have the same background, the same resources, the same support. So while we are all in the same storm, we are all in the architectural profession, or we are all trying to find our way in the world, in this, in this community, in this, in this city, in the state, we, we are not all in the same boat. So what works for some does not work for all. So a very um, excellent example of this is just history. Um, so this is an example of Levittown in New York. There are many Levittowns around, around the country, but um, the, this example here shows that Levittown was a federally subsidized uh, development and a family was able to buy a $75,000 house with no money down. That family had to be white, had to be. You could not be African-American and buy a home in Levittown. In fact, if you were African-American, the home that you could buy had to have 20% down. So you can see here, the way these numbers add up, generational wealth has has just ballooned. So this difference between no, not 
you're you're buying a house of the same monetary value. So it, it's 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 not about um, well, you know, this person had had a an, had a better job and they were able to afford a a nicer nicer house. It's the same monetary value, but you can see how wealth has accrued over generations, how that 20% down payment may have been a barrier to entry to those Black families in history. And that generational growth, that difference is, is astronomical. So what does that mean today? How does that relate to what we're talking about? Justice in architecture today. When you look at the debt, the student loan debt for architects, Black female architects bear the brunt of it. You know, Black female architects, Black architects have by far the highest average debt. Why is that? So how can we remove cost being a barrier to entry um, to this profession? How can we uh, think about what might those other barriers to entry be um, in order to bring more justice into, into our practice. So again, going back to our, you know, as we talk about the definitions of Jedi here today, if you're just joining us, we're talking about justice in, in our profession, being about acknowledging and removing those barriers to entry. So you can say, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, but you have to acknowledge, you have to know, not, over, not everyone has a pair of boots or the same quality boots. Uh, so these are really important ideas to, to bring in to the actions you take and the decisions you make. So looking at the career span, from graduation to retirement, what might be some of those barriers? Other, other than cost, which is um, you know, architecture, even, even if you have means, it's, it's an expensive undertaking, just higher ed, material supplies. Um, you know, it's, it's an architecture degree is an expensive undertaking and our testing as well. Um, but what else? What else? Um, so one of them might be finding the right fit Finding, finding not only a university that's a right fit, but a firm. As you're, you're working through, through your profession, the work-life integration, uh, particularly for women uh, who bear the brunt of childcare. So as you think about what might make someone drop off from architecture, what might make someone not keep going, these are, these are the places and these are the critical moments where we need to take a, take a strong look at ourselves, at our profession, at our practices and see where and what can we do better. So step one, identify the issue. So it's not, you know, nothing when we talk about Jedi, talk about um, diversity, not when we talk about justice, nothing is black and white. Um, it's, it's not simple. Like it's a, it's a complex issue that compounds over time and it's intersectional. Meaning when you talk to me about my experiences, you have to understand I'm coming at you, not just as a woman, not just as a black woman, but as a black Hispanic woman. And that's not even it, right? So all of our identities come together and interact in different ways. And so that is intersectionality um, in a nutshell. Um, so when you're, once you identify the issue, you also need to identify the power structure, right? What, what is the organization? Who is the person that is controlling this, that is allowing this to, uh, to remain the way it is, or basically, where where do we need to uh, where do we need to attack? Where do we need to to implement our actions? Center the people. Now, this is this is really important. Um, a lot of I'm going to say well-meaning people are you know they they might think that they're 
they have a plan, have a um, solution, but if it is not, if the solution or the plan is not coming from the people who are being affected by the issue, you know, you're missing the mark. You're missing the mark. So listen, um, and then fostering um, a sense of belonging, you know, creating these opportunities. Uh, so how can people feel like their voices are being heard, that their participation is important? Uh, so this will break down those barriers to entry by listening to the people who are, who are ostensibly uh, behind said barriers. So step one, when you're, when you're going, you know, I've decided to become an architect. Step one, go to architecture school. What school are you selecting? So no one, no one wants to be alone. I can tell you this from personal experience, being the only in any place is terrible. It's, it's difficult, it's challenging, and there is a weight put on you, an unfair weight, an unjust weight put on you to represent everyone in your culture, in your community um, of your same or similar identity. So I, I, I frequently say diversity begets diversity. And so people of, of color, uh, tend to go to these, you know, traditionally uh, minority serving institutions. And I do hate that word minority, but that's a, um, so when you, when you look at the fact that out of over, uh, what is that, 139 accredited NAB program, 32% of black architecture students go to seven of those schools. So 32%, I should have done this map earlier, but seven out of 139 is 5%, 5%. So 32% of black students go to 5% of NAB accredited programs. And that's just the students. The architects, those who graduate, who finish, who you know get licensed, it's, it's half. So why is that happening? Because diversity begets diversity. These students are not seeing themselves in the other 95% of programs. Um, same with Hispanic students who attend traditionally Hispanic serving institutions. You know, these numbers are not, you know, it's not a coincidence. It's you go to these schools and you feel like you belong. There's a place for you there. Another barrier to entry is the fact that the, the, um, the teaching staff does not represent you. So as if, if you are, if you're listening and you're in higher ed, whether you're administrator, if you have the opportunity to work in college admissions and recruitment, if you have the opportunity to uh, hire professors. These, these are things that matter. What schools, what high schools are you going to for your high school visits, for your, your college fairs? You know, are you being, I actually did work in college admissions and recruitment, and I can, I can tell you that um, we did a lot of targeting of, uh, of schools with students who were high achieving and yet um, high paying. So are you, are you targeting the other, the other side of that? You know, when I'm saying high achieving and high paying, that goes back to the Levittown story. The students in Levittown whose parents were able to pay for a private school education. So how is that just? that because they got a house way back when um, for no money down, that now they're being actively recruited into higher ed. So as a university, think about that. Think about that barrier to entry. 
who are you recruiting? Where are you recruiting from? And who, who is teaching your courses? Uh, studies show that people who see themselves in, you know, whether it's um, a black student seeing a, a black, at least one black teacher before third grade, their outcomes improve. If they can see it, they can be it. Uh, so having people who represent you in the role that you're looking to get is important. This isn't, this isn't just Vanessa talking. This isn't just me philosophizing. This is science. This is fact that if, if they see it, they can be it. Ooh, sorry. We're jumping. Okay. So keeping, keeping this one in mind. So I'm going to stay on this one. Um, as a firm, who are you recruiting and where are you recruiting from? Are you recruiting from predominantly white institutions for your, for your internships, for your, um, you know, for your hires of, of recent grads? So these are, these are things to keep in mind of where can you do better? What gate are you standing in front of? And how can you help open up that gate? How can you help remove that barrier to entry for a more just profession? And then finally, as, um, as a university, if you're, if you're in higher ed, what's your curriculum like? Um, full disclosure, uh, I am also an, an adjunct professor and I taught a course this past spring where the student, there was a student who wanted to talk about cultural appropriation and was shy and apprehensive about broaching this, this subject of cultural appropriation in what we call one of the master's designs, right? So how do we, one, get away from this Eurocentric um, white supremacist curriculum that we essentially follow because that is what we were taught. That is what we were taught and that is what we hand down generation past after generation. So how do we change the conversation? How do we change the narrative? So Dark Matter University is um, a fantastic resource of, it's a, a collaborative, a collective of people who want to not only change the narrative of architectural curriculum, but change the narrative of architectural education as a whole. Um, so decolonize your education, uh, move, teach, teach real history. You know, how many of us went through architecture school not knowing, never learning, that Black Bottom was an African-American community that was kicked out and raised in order to build Miss Vanderoe's Lafayette Park. How many of us went, went through all of architecture school not knowing uh, that Seneca Village was a traditionally Black community that was kicked out and displaced in order to build Central Park? So these things are important. These things are important to learn about in our history and our education. So in order to bring to bring justice into our into our education, these changing the conversation, changing the curriculum is important. Another obstacle, another barrier, the final final one on higher ed, I promise, um, is I don't know about all of y'all, but when I started my architectural ven venture, I did not understand, I did not know that most places, most, most states required a NAB accredited degree in order to get licensed. And so a lot of, a lot of people may not know that. And a lot of people, um, may then find themselves going to grad school and then you know that's that's more money that's more cost and so the what's what's interesting is that is the enrollment here where you know 58 percent of 
white students are in uncredited NAB programs, but only 45% of Black or African American students are in an accredited NAB program. So that 55% that will then need to go to a second, a second degree program in order to get a license. How are we educating our students so that that second degree is not now a barrier? So that's, you know, a 10% difference, which it, when it comes down to raw numbers, understanding that, um, sorry, this is, you know, numbers that, but, you know, 10 per, a 10% difference when the Black um, student population is only about 5% of overall student population. When, it, when you transfer that to, to raw numbers, sheer quantity, it makes a huge difference because it's, you know, that 10% difference in the white or Caucasian represents in raw numbers, possibly like the same or more numbers of students. Um, so it's really important to be able to support our, our BIPOC students in their path to licensure and giving them the information they need to get there. We've graduated, you know, we've, we've done all of the work now to dismantle these barriers to entry in architectural education. So we've, we've done our justice work in architectural education. What next? So here in this um, equity, equity by design survey that it really graphs the, you know, change over time through, through your profession. So depending on your identity over on the left, uh, you have different outcomes over on the right. So um, whether you're a sole practitioner or working in a non-architectural related field, um, are you licensed or are you not licensed? And how, how does childcare also play into that? You will see that, you know, women lean towards the, um, you know, just the designer roles, whereas the men will lead more towards the principal roles. So why why is that? Why does that why does that happen? How is licensure a barrier to entry to to the rest of your career, to the rest of the profession? How is childcare a barrier to entry? Um, so how can we? dismantle these barriers in order to create a more just profession. Um, so I'm going to point everyone in, in terms of practice, in terms of firms, uh, looking to understand what they what they should do, what they need to do, what they what they might need to incorporate into into their own practice are the AIA guides for equitable practice. And these are these points are kind of the heading and it's almost like we can spend an hour talking about each one of these. Um, but I'm just gonna point out compensation. Um, a bear, that's, that's a barrier right there. Some, some people cannot change careers or leave architecture because, because of compensation. Um, we know not just in architecture, but Again, this is this is science. This is research. This is fact. That women tend to go after things that they feel a hundred percent comfortable going after, confident in. Men, not so much. Maybe maybe 70 percent. So that, on top of a whole measure of other things, uh, creates um, you know unequal pay. We just had Black Women's Equal Pay Day last week. We still hadn't have not had Hispanic women's equal pay date yet this year. So Hispanic women are still working to make the same amount, still working into 2021 uh, to make the same amount that men did in 2020. So just let that sink in because we are currently at, in August. We are well be, beyond half the year. Um, mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, that 
mentorship and sponsorship is a really important um, point because people tend to gravitate to people who look like them. So if you are in a position of power, if you are um, in hiring, if you are a firm principal, if you are you know, a project lead, think about who you're bonding with in your firm and why. Are you op offering the same amount of mentorship to people of different identities or is it just the people who remind you of you? And when you are of a certain demographic, when the, when the architectural profession, architectural leadership are stereotypically older white men, then that means that they're, they're gravitating towards mentoring those younger white men. Um, so that is something that to be really intentional about. Who are you mentoring? How? Um, because mentorship is again one of those one of those barriers to entry. So I once read, I, I was in a conversation about firm culture um, with some people and and I read an article that has stuck with me for years that Sheryl Sandberg wrote the book Lean In. And sometimes when women lean in, what they find themselves leaning up against is the unmovable wall of structural and institutional sexism. So when we talk about justice in architecture, we're talking about smashing down that wall. So I invite you all to grab a sledgehammer. Um, so this is this this comic right here uh, illustrates exactly what I'm talking about, where the man is helping the man and not helping the women. So um, when this the, this also goes back to this growth in our student population, but not in our professionals, where architecture students has a 50-50 split. But as you go through your career, as you hit those pinch points, as you become a little, a little more jaded, um, this is where the drop offs happen. So these are the moments where we need to we need to remove these barriers and smash these walls in order to create a more just profession. And you might be thinking. But that's not me. Um, there's a difference. And I, I hope you have all seen the iceberg before uh, because it's really a, 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 a bit of a cliche analogy where, you know, the Titanic didn't, didn't sink because of the iceberg it saw. It sunk because of the 90% that was underwater. Um, and when it comes to bias, like the biases that we have, these, these outward opinions, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, implicit bias, institutional sexism, institutional racism, that's the other 90%. Um, so addressing those and working to acknowledge that they, exi they exist. It doesn't make you a bad person. Everybody has implicit bias. It is not a judgment on you and your character. You just have to acknowledge that these biases exist and do the work to dismantle whatever barriers that you're a gatekeeper of, to open the gates to wherever, whatever career pinch point that you're standing next to. Um, so I apologize for these, um, somewhat, this is a kind of blurry graphic, but this is from Equity by Design's uh, 2018 survey as well. Um, but the darkest is, you know, principals, the, in the middle are mid-level staff, and then all staff in the lightest. But basically, I mean, what, what's your path to promotion? Principals think it's clear, whereas most of the staff is, is saying, I don't really know. Um, and some of these, the path towards leadership here is either one, unclear, or two, 
also dependent on relationships within the firm and licensure. So having a clear and identifiable path towards leadership, towards promotion is really important because it takes away from that je ne sais quoi quality of, oh, but he reminds me of me when I was young. Well, you know, there's, there's enough of you in this profession. Um, similarly, what are the reasons people are leaving? What, what are the reasons people are staying? Um, training, training is important. Community, no friends at work is a reason people are leaving. So community is important. So how are you fostering that? Um, what is it that is making people to, people stay? And are you making sure that everyone has access to that? And so I'm gonna wrap up the presentation portion of this. Um, I don't know where I found this quote, but many years ago, I was, um, I was, I was blessed with an opportunity to, to speak with a lot of people um, working within the, you know, within the street harassment field, because when you're constantly, constantly being harassed, the second you walk out your door, you stop wanting to walk out your door. Uh, and this quote has stuck with me because it's, it's true. Space is fundamental in every exercise of power. Um, Brian Lee, who's a, an advocate in design justice, um, he says, for every injustice in the world, there is an architecture designed to perpetuate it. So space and justice are intrinsically tied. So that is why our jobs, our, our profession is so important. Um, so when you're bringing design justice into your practice and you're, you're acknowledging that space, that architecture, that city planning has a big impact in justice, how do you evaluate the decisions that you're making, the actions you're taking? So here, I'm gonna point you to uh, the Anti-Racist Design Justice Index. Um, and any action you take can be graphed on this, on this chart where, the, where your x-axis goes from equality, um, equity, all the way past justice into, into liberation, which is the next step after inclusion um, in the Je Jedi agenda. But that's, you know, that's the, the that's the next the next step. Once we're all we've accomplished Jedi, we have achieved liberation. But what is this? What is this action? What is this Y axis? Right. So each action has um, a place where it's equity, justice, diversity, um, and then it also has these self reflective um, moments about how our design institutions um, understand and acknowledge um, history, how we can hold ourselves accountable for the present, and then how we can increase representation. These, the reciprocal category, um, all still going down that y-axis, um, asks for reparations. How can we repair the harm done to BIPOC populations? Reparations. How, how accessible are our um, institutions, our communities, our spaces? You know, it, it's lovely that you designed that beautiful park, but if it's not accessible to the community, how successful was that design? And then influence. Um, how has, has this really reclaimed resources and power to change culture, to change the story and change the narrative. So all these actions are, can be graphed here um, from the status quo on the top, top left. Um, this is my left hand. I don't know if you guys see me mirrored or not, but all the status quo on the top left, all the way down to liberation um, on the bottom right. 
And if you go to the um, to this index, you'll see equality, all of these actions, equality, equity, justice, um, all the way to liberation, and then moving down from acknowledgement all the way down to influence. So, you know, the smallest thing will be here in this, the, the smallest action, this, the smallest impact, impactful action will be over here on the top left and to the, the most impactful action. And this, the anti-racist design justice index has so many, so many actions and so many things that you can do, whether you're um, an organization, a practice, um, academia. Um, so this is a really excellent resource for you to look at what are the actions that I can take other than, you know, things that we've talked about today. Um, and how do you how do you measure these actions and how do you how do you implement them into your practice? Um, and so I'm going to end with a quote by uh, Bernice King's Twitter, daughter of Martin Luther King. Um, Shirley Chisholm said, if they won't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Shirley Chisholm being the first um, African-American congresswoman and the first woman to run for for president. Um, but um, if you're inviting someone to the seat at to a seat at your table, you're still implying ownership of that table. Um, so let's rebuild the table. So that that's the challenge um, that I present to everyone here today. Um, where here we this is you know this is a traditional barn raising, um, and the, there are traditional um, home home house building um, that indigenous communities have done. Uh, so the the background is there where communities come together to build something together. So let's throw out this table that was built under the mantle of the patriarchy of white supremacy, and let's build a new table together based on justice, based on uh, tearing down these barriers to entry to the table building to begin with. Um, so with that, I'm gonna leave you with um, some resources and reading material. Uh, Equity by Design, which was initiative, uh, an initiative uh, spearheaded by AIA San Francisco, is a fantastic resource um, for, for all things Jedi, all things justice. Um, the Guides for Equitable Practice by AIA, um, creating a culture of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion for your architecture firm. Um, that's a, a resource from Perkins and Will the Anti-Racist Design Justice Index. And SoFlo Noma has, um, if you go to our website, we have a Goodreads that has um, a number of amazing books and literature and resources um, that, that are just must reads um, on both this topic and the, and, you know, the history of, of racism in our country, redlining, et cetera, um, from Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist to, um, oh shoot, what was the last one I finished? Um, so the, a, lot of, a lot of really good books there on that list. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and move on to any questions in the chat. Um, does anyone have any questions? So in the chat, we have from Naomi about Overtown um, and other Black Miami neighborhoods. Uh, yes, um, the freeway system is not an accident. Uh, the way it was designed, where it was placed. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline is also not an accident, the, you know, that it goes through indigenous lands. Um, um, Mount Rushmore. That was a sacred, a, a sacred mountain that was desecrated. Um, so all of this is not, you know, space is not accidental. Uh, the actions taken um, in claiming space is not accidental. Uh, so that's just, those are just things to keep in mind. 
All right. Um, in the chat, and please feel free to either, you know, now unmute yourself, uh, unmute yourself, ask a question, and fine. Um, what is one way to break the barrier of teachers in architecture schools? The requirements themselves to become a teacher are more strewn towards white candidates. Accurate, meaning uh, minorities are less likely to have a master's degree for varying, varying reasons and cost being the biggest one. Yes, a hundred percent. And I'm just gonna throw this out there, but what in the world is the difference between a five-year B arc and a five-year M arc? Like we all get licensed, uh, whether we have a B arc or an M arc. So um, in terms of academia, um, the standard is of course the terminal degree. Not every school requires that. And there are a number of people and a number of advocacy groups trying to change that, trying to change that narrative. So if you're working in academia, think about that. What are, what are the requirements and why? Um, can you be unlicensed and teach? Um, or is licensure, licensure um, important? And if licensure is important, then why do we need a master's? Um, so there is, there is a there is a thousand percent a lot of conversation um, advocating to remove that master's requirement because we have a professional degree with the BARC, um, and that and experience should be more than enough, you know. So. Um, you know, changing changing that narrative, changing changing what you're asking for, and um, you know, no matter who you are, I, I I still don't understand the difference between a BR and an MR, but that's that's just me. Like, any other questions? And feel free to unmute yourselves. This is Naomi, of course, you know, I'm going to jump in there again because I don't like Go silence. For it. Go for but, it. you know, you know, one of the things that um, I'm facing right now in terms of, you know, again, barriers, et cetera, for, for you know, as, as a word is um, it's, it's becoming more frustrating and more um, discouraging taking my licensure exams, especially when NCARB jointly with NOMA has come up with statistics that even the NCARB exams, the ARE exams are, are pretty much, and I'm paraphrasing, strewn to white candidates. In other words, they've said statistically, a white person will pass the ARE at a much, and they use the word much, higher rate than those of color. And, you know, I mean, I know that we're not changing the world right here, right now, you know, but those are other barriers that, you know, women, especially women of color, people of color, <laughs> find, you know, daunting that the profession that they love and, and respect and want to be in and have a passion for, essentially is kind of fighting against them. <laughs> yeah. Well, something, something that is interesting, um, is you know standardized standardized testing as a whole has a very racist history. Standardized testing was developed to prove that blacks were inferior to whites intellectually. It it wasn't developed to test a theory. It was developed to prove a theory, which is just you know not the right way to not the scientific method at all. Um, and many, many, at least in, in undergraduate universities, many of them are recognizing and realizing that the SATs are full of crap, um, that the ACTs are full of crap. Um, so, so what are these tests measuring? Now, the ARES are obviously not the SATs or the ACTs, but even as a, as a professional, when you objectively look at the, these things, you know, the, the study materials are, are basically telling you, do not take this test like you practice. Um, so why is that? Um, and there are a lot of, you know, a lot of barriers to entry to the ARES as well, whether it's the study materials, the study 
the study resources, um, just, you know, the, the ability to get to the testing center. Um, there's a plethora of reasons why um, BIPOC people would not do as well that have nothing to do with their capacity or knowledge to be an architect. So I, I you know, I personally applaud N NCARB for the work that they've done over the past few years because, um, you know, for for the the students or um, recent grads, you used to have to work three thousand hours before you even started. Um, so they are at least trying to change something, but you're you're absolutely right. These tests are a barrier, and these tests, you know, these tests, these standardized tests were developed specifically as a barrier. Um, but it, you know, ask. Uh, um, we have a plethora of licensed architects in this room that the tests don't measure your Well, you know, I, I find interesting, and again, I mean, Marky, when I took this exam, and I, it's for different for everybody, when I took PA, I mean, I passed it the first time. Uh, I know I know others who ha have taken it three or four times, but that was specifically one of the ones that NCARB slash NOMA said was the hardest one for, you know, a Black person to pass. And I can see why it would be, because again, you know, layouts of cities and towns and, you know, all those things, program and analysis are based in mostly white centric neighborhood ideology and ways that they, they you know, steeped in, you know, a hundred years or whatever it is of, of planning that yeah. did not include black neighborhoods. Ooh, you think architecture has a numbers problem? The, well, uh, the APA, the APA. But. I saw Lourdes pop in. I, did you have a question or a comment, Lourdes? Actually, I, I do have a question, and I realized I took this exam a long time ago. So, um, and I'm not disputing the idea that the questions are um, biased. I'm just trying to figure out how. What are they asking that's biased? You know, how 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 is it? Uh, I get the the city things, but. Um, I, I guess I'm again. I haven't taken this exam in so long, so I'm not quite sure what the questions. How are they framed to to have this bias? It's just a curiosity. Students themselves question. are biased, Lourdes. I mean, personally, again, personally, as somebody who's taking it recently, um, but it's not that the questions themselves are biased. And I didn't even have that thought until I read that article because I got a, a, a newsletter from you know X Y Z, and that was what NCARB had as a statistic, you know. Um, so I, I, I personally don't think that the questions themselves are biased. I do understand why in theory, the program and an analysis, which they, they, they kind of took out as a, a specific was, was harder or more skewed, you know, I don't know what they're doing about it, but they're writing about it certainly, you know, yeah. so at least they're acknowledging something. <laughs> okay. I was just curious how, yeah. how the questions would, would be. And it's not necessarily the questions because, you know, in the example of the SATs, there's a whole math section, you know, that you can't really bias math. One plus one will always equal two, um, but it's the structure of the exams, the nature of the exams, uh, the nature of education. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a complex issue. Um, but the design of the exam was specifically, the design of the SATs was specifically designed to prove the, the, the theory. Um, and so standardized tests such as, such as the ARES have this history and have this, have this background. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, thank are there, you. Are there, are there next better steps or next steps to? Um, we're discussing it. So now, what do we do? So this is just part one of a four-part series. So join us next week, and we'll we'll discuss equity. Um, but in when it comes to 
to justice. Um, you know, keep in mind today we're discussing, we're, we're funneling the conversation to, to, dis, to discuss justice in architecture. Justice meaning these removing these barriers to entry. So um, just to kind of synopsize um, some of the things that I that were said was, um, one is that you have to self-evaluate because depending on what gate you're standing in front of, you know, you, you will be more effective or have more influence with this action or that action. So, um, you know, I personally, don't have I'm not standing in front of the ARE gate. So that's not that's not an action or or a cause that I would have the biggest impact on. Um, but you know, maybe you're in charge of hiring in your firm. Maybe you work in higher ed. So where where along those career pinch points do you stand? Um, and I think one of the most important things to um, to think about is, is centering the conversation about around the people who are most impacted. So it's not about you. It's not about what you went through or what your experiences were, even if you're of a similar identity, but how is this impacting people now? Um, you know, you, you might think that you pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, but recognize that not everyone has the same pair of boots. We're not all in the same boat. Um, so listening is very important because what happens so, so frequently is that people talk and people express what they need and are not heard. And so then the next time they stay silent. So creating a culture where the next time they won't stay silent, where people feel heard and they're, they're they can feel that they can express their needs. And then we've, you know, we've, we've self-reflected. We've looked at what gates we're standing in front of. We've, we've decided that, you know, this is a career pinch point where I'm standing in front of. Then it's, it's about opening those barriers. If you're, if you're looking at higher ed, you're reaching out to those students, particularly though, you know, um, looking at where you're recruiting from in your college admissions and recruitment. Um, you are educating the students, not just in architecture, but in what the next steps are for licensure. It, it is not just that so, such a large percentage of BIPOC students um, are, in, are not in accredited programs. That is yet another barrier that will require them to get yet another degree uh, to be licensed in most juris jurisdictions. So this is information that needs to be that needs to be disseminated. If you are in a firm, if you are a firm owner, leader in charge of hiring, you know, keep in mind that 50% of black architects come from seven schools, you know, that that the same with uh, Latin, the Latinx population, 50% of Latin students go to traditionally Latin serving institutions. Uh, so if you find yourself trying to recruit, where are you recruiting from? What are the institutions that you're reaching out to? And if you're only getting a certain demographic, then you have to broaden, broaden those, those searches. Um, Mentorship, being very intentional about mentorship, being very intentional about these programs, these, these opportunities that you're giving out. You might say, okay, but they have to seize an opportunity. Sometimes opportunities are handed out before anybody even knew there was one to seize. So it's about self-reflection. It's about looking at what you have done historically, what your firm has done historically and how you can do better. Even if you think you're doing okay, how can you do better? Um, so having clear and transparent written processes 
or promotion. This is going to come up again in, in future Jedi discussions. Having clear and transparent processes makes things so that there is no there is no fuzzy area, there is no gray area, there is no je ne sais quoi quality that gets filled by, oh, you just remind me of me when I was young. Um, so those are those are um, some of the, the larger ones. And of course, align yourself with, with some of these national conversations with the Dark Matter University, with the Design Justice Index. Um, you know, use, use these resources as tools to implement into your practice, into your profession, into your curricula. All right. Well, thank you everyone. And I hope you will all join us next Tuesday for part two, where we will dissect equity. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, great job. Thank you.